morning, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you, but we're going to get started. It's 6.05 for my awesome third minute speaker. Is that right, Jonas? Are you all set, Jonas? Yes. Yeah, OK. So welcome, everybody. Uh, we wanted to start today by acknowledging that it's Yom Kippur today, and we uh, just by trying to be constant for community members to know that we meet every first Wednesday and Thursday Wednesday, we totally overseen that it was the highest holiday. So we apologize for that, and we'll try to get to not try. We'll we try to keep working in our calendar so that it's not uh, you know that we're not disrespecting any holiday for any ethnicity or religion. So with that, uh, I'm going to pass it on to Megan just to do the acknowledgement of the mic. Sorry, you're all good. You're welcome. We're just right here. Okay. Not the mic coming in. I'm practicing. Oh, I'm really tired. <laughs> so we just want to acknowledge that Unit 32 is located on the land that's long served as a site of meeting and exchange among indigenous peoples for thousands of years and is home of the Western Abenaki people. Unit 32 honors, recognizes, and respects these peoples, especially the Abenaki, as the traditional stewards of the land and waters on which we gather today. In that spirit, today we will begin by acknowledging that we're guests in this land and we need to respect and help protect the lands within our use. So one of our four goals is community engagement. So tonight uh, we're hoping that you can help us improve our understanding of the larger community. And we want to tap into that. You know, I know that we don't have a lot of community members, but we have enough people here to know the community and this is one of the first steps not our only step in our quest for having better community engagement. It, this will help us communicate better with our communities and create opportunities for us to have a dialogue back and, back and forth and it, so that we together can best support our college schools. So, um, so yeah, there we go. When we met in September, um, in person, there was a small group um, that came and participated, and we had also sent out a survey for people who couldn't come out, which as an aside, we've done the same for tonight as well. Um, there were a couple of themes. The board is a little longer summary of what we learned from the input session. Um, we asked folks to tell us what are the most effective ways for people to receive information, um, they really like their local school um, communication. They do like newsletters. Um, the things that they most want to know about from the district level are things that pertain to everyone, kind of district-wide focus areas. Um, we asked them what are the most effective ways for them to share information with us. Um, there was some positive feedback around surveys. They, do, they cited school board meetings and forums. They had some feedback about getting too many emails. Um, and, and there was a lot more information really helpful for the board. But one of the reasons I share this today is, is because we also acknowledge that it's a pretty small group of people that gave us this feedback. And that's part of what tonight is designed to help surface. So we are good at school systems of communicating in pretty traditional ways, and we are trying to expand that. Um, it is not to discount the feedback we do get from these these methods, because it is really important. It's been helpful. We, have, we will make some changes just based on that. But tonight is about figuring out the voices that we are not hearing because of our the way that we typically communicate. So that's, that's kind of what this piece is here. And this is only the very beginning of this. We don't, we don't have one conversation about community mapping and say, oh, we've checked that box. It's, this is really going to connect to the longer term planning of the board and um, some deeper work. So thanks for being part of this first piece. So you're in tables for a reason. Um, and you all follow directions nicely and sat at the table, hopefully where you live. Those of us who do not live in the community, we will float around. Um, we're going to do this part for about 20 minutes. You're going to talk in your town groups. And the goal here is to surface things about your community that the board would need to know to be able to seek engagement with those members of the community. Here are a couple questions, but there's, it's meant to be a conversation. 
What are some of the gathering places in your town? Who are key community organizations or people, right? Our towns are small. Who are some of the voices we miss in our towns and how might we engage them? And what else? And the goal for this first 20 minutes is to stay at your table. There's chart paper. So in a way, we want two people to record. One person will take markers and jot themes on the chart paper, which will be important for the next activity. The other person, there is a sheet of paper on each table. Um, some of you might have actual contact information for people that, we, that the board might want. So that's what that second piece of paper is. But the goal is to have conversation, talk about these, um, go beyond these questions, and then jot down on the chart paper answers to these questions, people that you want to see, organizations you think the board should um, connect. The next activity, I will flip it back. But it, afterwards, we will break up, and you will then leave your community table and wander to the other tables to read what they have to say. Some of you know your other communities very well, too. You might have additional things you could add. So we will kind of leave the town tables shortly. <clears throat> Questions about this first part? No, and we're sort of right on time. So we'll set a timer and have a conversation. Okay. I'm Shelly. I'm like, I really Well, we see each other after. Right. Yeah. I was like, last night. 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 And I'm wondering if your kids were there. When were they there? So they're 25 and 26 now. Yeah, they were. Um, Zora and Dashiell. Yeah, and what were you doing? I was the reading intervention. Oh, okay. So I worked we mostly you with the libraries. youngest. And, um, us, you know, not everyone. Mm -hmm. But so I we're remember good. their names. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Zora's in speaking English. Where? Concord Academy. Concord Academy. Wow. Yeah. So that's my, how far all those stories went with her. My kids are 27 and 29. And they, well, Will was there for kindergarten, and then we moved to Florida for a couple years to take care of my dad, and then we came back. And then he was there for four years. And then here. Yeah. Gathering places. Who would like to do? I can write. There's this and that. Um, <laughs> the school. Okay. That's school the school is right. And the records. Do you want to write, Lindy? Sure. I'm going to write. I always think of Dudley's. Yeah, we should. Yeah, Dudley's is, the same one. is an informal gathering place. Yeah. No restaurants. No. Oh, Fox Den. That is the Fox Market. That oh. Fox Market is oh, yeah. white. Fox Market. Oh. It is a gathering. Once yes, I was there, but they didn't have anything to eat, and I was really they're, hungry. They have <laughs> haven't been back. Breakfast sandwiches food, are food, amazing. Okay. Yeah, you can even so like, Fox, like a million dollars. Well, there's I that. Haven't tried. Yeah, I stopped today. Put them there. I think it's. I think it's. I think it's. Yeah, she gets dinner there a lot. I call them. Yeah. about the chickens because I said, oh, they have roasted chickens. And I thought, well, I don't need to know my chicken that well. Oh, they're from the transfer station. Yeah. OK, that's nicer than dumb. <laughs> BP and Sons transfer station. <laughs> Do people gather there? Oh, definitely. There's always people that talking. Is a, that is in. I, <clears throat> it's like the post office. I, we could have a Marshfield address and get mail at the house, but it would be one less point of contact. It's the same as having a landline. Like I would never talk to my in-laws if we didn't have a landline. <laughs> they would um, never call me. When it's finished, the East Callis General Store when it's yep. done. Yeah, because when and we didn't talk about Maple Corner Store, but that is also well, a that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's a whammy, that's bar. A whammy bar. Whammy bar slash Maple Corner Store. Yeah. And so number 10 and Curtis, like boat launches, swim areas. Oh, yeah. 
Um, we have trails now too, and some people gather mm -hmm. to bike or hike those trails, like the town trails. We've got a couple active farm stands that. Yes. Yep. Schoolhouse and uh, mm -hmm. Pooley Flats. Pooley Flats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe yeah, it's morbid, but the cemeteries are another place. So I pick my children's names. <laughs> and even the roads. I mean, how often do you have to be like, yeah, I'm sitting, I'm sitting, they're still talking. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, it could <laughs> bus stops. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Okay. So this, that'll probably, is there anything we're missing? Town hall, school, Whammy Bar, Maple Corners. Uh, town clerk's yeah. office. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Town office. Hi. Hi. Mm -hmm. I just want to give you a reminder that we're live. Just in case you didn't know. Yeah. So, yeah. I, no. um, the, the, you know, to brag, the school is a. Yeah. I mean, it's been town meeting, it's been voting. Yeah. Um, yeah. We pretty much, again, my first year, and now we're getting back to but with our building use procedure, um, I mean, we'll have the. The uh, Historical Society is going to be doing a bike thing in November um, evening, like people using it for birthday parties. Mm -hmm. you know, well, that may be something that in a town like Berlin, that, and maybe that's different than the other, it really is. If, if there is engagement around the school, then that might be... Right. Yeah. The, the Grange yeah. is, um, is, a, is a place of opportunity. It's not really in Berlin, but because we support it. Because is that, I think it's right before the line or it's right after the line? Well, no, it's, is it it's, in Berlin? It is in Berlin because we had to vote on whether or not we taxed. <laughs> Okay. So yeah. Yeah. So but, it is yeah, and it's, it's available right to um, to be used by community members. And it gets a fair bit of use. I mean, mm -hmm. like we used yeah. to always there used to always be something going on there. Whether it has the old artwork from the school mm -hmm. is in it, you know. So uh, once they renovate. Worcester Neighborhood Network. Oh, yeah, the Worcester Neighborhood Network. Yeah. What the Worcester, Worcester Neighborhood, neighborhood Network? Or the Neighbor Network. Worcester Neighbor Network. I think it's... Uh, WNN. I don't know. She keeps track of all the people with young children moving into the area. Oh, okay. It's a... I don't really know the details except I get their emails sometimes. So it, they, they at some point <laughs> invited people to join, and it's like if you would ever be interested in helping out a neighbor in need, oh, okay. so like if, if someone has surgery and needs meals, like that might be a time that they send out an email, or if someone needs their wood stacked and you have to do with them, whatever. Oh, it's like okay. It's like neighbors helping neighbors, but it's a, you know. Hmm. It sounds like Front Porch Forum, but your own version. I, I just it, I love this Front Porch Forum. Forum. After leaving Northfield, which was a total dumpster fire, and coming to Worcester, where people are like, "Somebody dropped their wallet. I want to make sure you get it." Does anybody have? Does anybody need a child care seat? You know, and it's like in Northfield, it was like, "Why don't you just yell at and swear at everybody mm. all the time?" Lovely. <laughs> it was just so awesome. Can we just catch the damn sheep, though? Yeah. <laughs> and there's a lot of dogs that seem to go missing. I mean, I do feel like there's a and lot of Usually someone gets on and rants about, like, don't let your cats out. This is, this they is, will get eaten. This is missing cat season. <laughs> My oh. cat has not gone missing yet. <laughs> oh, God, knock on wood. I know. <laughs> Are there any okay, other live physical yeah. gathering places? The dump. Front Porch Forum or... Yeah, I mean, Front Porch Forum. Front Porch yeah. Forum. Any other, it's Facebook or That's any other. Right. No, Front Porch Forum. Okay. <laughs> Um, might be a bias here too. I'm not. Um, Some Saturday morning, I may just show up at the dump. <laughs> just to see, and I feel like everybody will know there's an outside. Leverage is through, like the people that are involved in that tend to be involved with, you know, the rest of the school board information, but they might be a good conduit oh, wow. for being in touch with people who might not otherwise be out there. It was the beginning of the Town Meeting Solutions Committee. Yes, so, yes, so, yes. Susan Clark. Yes. So, Susan Clark, right? I mean, we'll just put her down as a... Yeah. She's an amazing resource. Um, um, Sarah Merriman is, too. So yeah, she's, like, yeah, yeah. she's involved in like the Vermont yeah. uh, Middlesex community, whatever community. We're listed 
it is? I just play shark. Oh my god, I see them. I mean, you're talking about all the people who are there and the what's up middle sex. Yeah. Right? We're listing a lot of leaders. And you're also part of that. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
which are, you know, most of all the communities, right? Right, right. But That's there's nothing, you know what I mean? There, it might be nice to have a, a booth and it has, like, each of the towns, but what is it that comes together? Yeah, so we're, we're super fortunate. For is it Arts Bash, you mm -hmm. Yeah, so we do those kinds of things. But, mm -hmm. um, well, in social media, what's our presence on social media? You know, is, is I mean, do we have statistics about? Didn't matter if you had a kid or not. You could We're just, having Thai breakfast. We're having I'm so excited. Breakfast. And the coats and coffee. Coats and coffee. Which next weekend? Like, no, that was this weekend. Shit, I missed it. Sorry. Well, that's all right. <laughs> you were live on television there, Mrs. Claire. Dr. Claire, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> Um, Did anyone show up? Were people better than me? No, people oh. came up, dropped coats, and then left. And Chris Pollard and I had a wonderful chat, which made me very glad that we only scheduled it for two hours. <laughs> it was a mistake to do it on the same day. We learned a lot. To do on the same day as the other the clothing, clothing swap. swap. Oh, the yeah. Clothing swap. That That's why yeah. I was thinking it was the weekend after the clothing yeah. swap. So I was we, very confused. Yes. There were things, so the school is, we're really trying to do more community things, like we're, we're having our second blood drive, um, and really looking at ways we're not, um, I have broken the news to Dell, so I can make it public, we are not doing a play this year. But I'll be yeah. back before wins, though. There you go. But we are going to do. <laughs> but we are going to do. We will, well, we'll have the winter concert and an art show, and then we're going to have a student showcase. So <laughs> classes will decide as classes what they want to do. So there may be a component that's a play that people are presenting things in the gym, and so it might start with people in the gym, and then people wandering around and just looking at ways of opening up the building more mm -hmm. to the community, mm -hmm. making it a community resource and having classes there um, you know, I'd, I'd say the, 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 beginning of the beginning of the year open house at the school at the school is a big event the open house open. are there any places outside of Worcester that Worcester folks go regularly Montpelier. Where would you go? Uh, grocery shop? Like, yeah, is there any shopping. engagement in any other, or does Worcester kind of... No, I, mean, I'm I sure think it depends on who... Yeah, then it starts to become different. A little separated? Okay. Yeah. Right. Like, Just wondering. there's probably the co-op crew. Yeah. yeah. There's, you know, the, yeah. the shop to shop. Yeah. It becomes more fractionated the further it gets. Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yep. Okay. That's what's great about the dump. We all have trash. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that is true. Like, why not? It switches interfaces, and in particular, because it uses fixed font sizes and does not have natural flow, like it doesn't reflow for the format of the device, so you end you up having to zoom in and then scroll back and forth in order to keep scroll reading. Across and then down, and then. Or I zoom in, out, yep, in, out, yep. in, out, in, out. I mean, I make it work. You it's not issue. my favorite. So it just the, the, you, the usability issue. Is and then you're the holding it back here. <laughs> focusing your eyes with your mouth. <laughs> which is attractive out in public. <laughs> now I'll know. If you I don't give it. That phrase is so that spot on. on. It's a trauma. It's totally right. And Caitlin yeah. will be like, would you like your glasses? Yeah. <laughs> no. And you can say no. I no, I don't. I don't I'm doing them. just fine. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Oh, that's hilarious. So then I'm stuck figuring out the line. It's not going to get any better. I'm still going to look weird. So we have like three or four minutes. Do you have something? So I do. I do have something. Have and maybe yeah. we still do this. And I'm just like going to it. With the uh, bonfire. Oh, um, at the so are you square. thinking the old bonfire where the they used to do the cornrows? And corn corn apple and cornrows. Corn I don't know yeah. where to what write this. I'm going to put it down the bottom. It was like we call that it was spring, the fair. spring fair. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gathering place, but it's a. Uh, it's at. Uh, I'm writing it down here because it's just. Uh, uh, is the food show still on? They shut down, they they shut down during COVID and now they have changed and they have like a grant system going on based on emails that I've received. 
corn roast in the fall. Got it, right? And so I know that the PTO. <laughs> did you smell the fly like out of the air? We've been It's kind of like Karate Kid moment. <laughs> Yeah, committed to education for sure. Yeah, or I think committed to education and art. Yeah, it comes up like, like the bowling you know, oh. I think we have three theaters if you count Cory Works. The herrings aren't going to come in. Where do we meet the bowling works where they are? Where do we meet the bowling And a love of historic preservation in Kent Corners is. Definitely exemplifies that. that. That just have lasted since I was a kid. Um, Bobby Fall Foliage Festival mm -hmm. every year. Right. Um, Black Fly Festival. That right? That's another important <laughs> one. It's newer, but mm -hmm. yeah. I, was, I thought it was interesting to see that they were doing a, a fall festival type thing at the rec field. Yeah. Yeah. That I was like, ooh, and I wasn't gonna be around, but now I'm gonna be around this week, and so I'm like, ooh, mm -hmm. I might just go down. I mean, here's an example, like the events committee for the Maple Corner Community Center is like planning a separate kids event for the community. My wife's on the committee. She's like, mm -hmm. there's this awesome thing that's already planned. Why are right. we? <laughs> right, right. So they. Change their mind, fortunately. Because they have to <laughs> go to that side of town. But it's like, <laughs> right? it's a long time. Then it has to be like thought through. It's just bizarre. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds really fun. Um, and it's interesting because oh, we are like matriarch of um, East Palace information passed a couple of years ago. Um, Arlene Leonard, and she. Oh, yeah. Hey, one of the kindergartners was playing I Spy as we waited for pickup. I spy oh, no. something <laughs> white. And we're all looking at the reveal, and she said, Your hair, Mrs. Johnson? I was like, Of course. So, <laughs> as, a, as a taxpayer in East Montpelier, I did not have children, so I had no sense of access to uh, the school. Um, happy to pay into it. But there was no relationship yeah. until I had kids, and then it, it, my world. It and that's exploded. why when people are so about my school, my town, and we have to have these town lines, which I think are ridiculous. My road is half East Montpelier, half well, so like three quarters East Montpelier, a quarter Callis. Yeah. If they had decided our whole road went to Callis, I would have aligned myself. With Callis. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I also think there's a whole um, group of people so living in the woods or people without children. People without children. Yeah. I hate to stop conversations, especially because some of you are just jumping into the missing voices yes. part of the conversation. But um, the goal now is to kind of break away from your town groups and take a look at what the other towns have written down. And it will spark new conversation. You can jot something on someone else's chart paper. You also may see something uh, that Middlesex wrote down and say, oh, that makes me think of, and then go back to your town and write it down. Um, so uh, it's nice to do it with a couple people so that you can keep chatting. But the goal is to move out of your town groups. And we'll do this for about 10 minutes. And then we'll just have an in for a small enough group. We'll have an informal conversation and share just what they learned from this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I don't know. Do you think we have any buddy who's living on farms who's not connected like they do with Fairmount and well, Templeton? Well, and um, Seth's McKnight Farm Who has a that? ton of Mexican workers Where's on Snowfield. Oh, okay. The big organic farm. Oh, yeah. I know and, what you're talking about. And he houses them, and they, yeah. he has a ton. He's been here uh, for years. Uh, I don't know if we have, I don't think we have any. No, yeah, he's been the only place that has the only the old gear, but right. they don't farm it. They don't farm it right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't they have two RVs? They have Matheson's and then they have... The other one got sold to a superstore and it's not locally. It's not oh, it's a... Um, well, we didn't write it down. It used to be locally Well, owned. no, Twin Valleys is more and, than just these Oh. They service like Callis, too. Oh. Um, yeah. And Plainfield. Yeah. Yeah. And Marshfield. Yeah. Did you get to hear it was really nice. The very they last did a really thing nice. on Saturday, one minute till noon, was my voice. Oh, but great. I never saw the TV one, so I don't know if they used I didn't my see TV that. one. I didn't see that, but they actually I heard. Watch, like, and TV to see it. Oh, yeah. Oh, Chris okay. and I had it, and you were watching it, and Jason Chen's show. Oh, yeah. It was so amazing. And then the woman, Heather, from Vermont Public, but I didn't see mine. Oh, okay. I've never heard of you know Consider that part of your town hall. Yeah, everything that happens at the town hall, the town, the community lunch, the clothing yes. swap. Oh yeah, your clothing swap. <laughs> your fireworks on there? That's Fourth of July. Yeah, you've got, you've got Fourth of July. Who are the, 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 the folks who do the mushroom farming? Oh, uh, Brian oh. and uh, Kevin. Yes, the Weissman. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I don't think public yeah. They started a town. You know what I mean? Yeah. Really, I didn't know that. Where about? But yeah, that's a good point. Where did they, where were I think it was East Palace. I think it was East Palace. No kidding. Yeah. Where is oh. the Whisker Dump? The what? Where is the dump? Um, it is on the Callis Road. If you go past the school, before you get to the bridge, it goes over the North Branch. It's sort of down there. Where are you live? Huh? Our side is where it's supposed I know. I understand. <laughs> I know. I know. If we lived somewhere else, we'd have a county road. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, the community lunch is huge. Yes. yes. Um, I live on Bear Farm. Bear Farm. Bear Farm. Posted there. It used to be Harry's. That's what it used to be. Oh, yeah. Harry yeah, said that. Harry's. Well, I'm just place. gonna say stories. I used to get nice fur clothes. Me too. I loved Harry's. <laughs> There's another. Harry's was Walmart before Walmart. Oh, it was. Yeah. It was so it was amazing. You walked in there. And was, what? Did what? They, like the circle yeah. farm. There's a little farm. That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> and I mean that yeah, in the best awesome. way. I I always I always knew when. When Christmas season was starting, because they put a Christmas tree on the roof of Harry's, and that was, was like for the, the start time. of the Christmas season. Harry's when they lit it up. Took me when I came to Vermont for my first trip. You have to go to Harry's. <laughs> and I was like, you can get the credit. Why would I want to? But I was from Florida. It was the place to go. So Jamie's around. Sporting. Yeah. 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 Plus, that's like. I was hearing the same thing when um, was it Ames? When that shut down, I was like, they should make that into a roller skating rink or something for teenagers to like go and have a safe space. Or when they shut down the um, the lumberyard. Rosemans across from, at the roundabout. Yeah, you know why they said uh, that. Yeah, but that was yes. a brownfield. <laughs> yes. What? It was a what? It was a brownfield. It was totally toxic. Yeah. Oh, too much I didn't know that. I mean, we've been buying our lumber there for years. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, no, we did too. But that would have been, I was like, that was a perfect space to, like, create this teen thing. Well, I guess not, but, yeah. I guess that's why they put the porta potty place there. Well, Anna had the same idea. <laughs> yeah, for they a got you and Anna should talk about a business plan. Yes, it was a super they, fun. Where they just where they just built that new auto parts store a few years ago. 
I see Peter all the time. Last time we made And I did it. Um, uh, it takes so I was asked. I I I <laughs> so no, so the Economic Development Council is just regional, so it's us, Waterbury, it's our community, Waterbury, most of the businesses are Waterbury and Berry kinds of businesses that are represented with Yes. So there's so the central part of the economic makes the CBE development It's an organization that will work with the Department of Labor. We actually we actually belong to businesses that are and it's usually all so the business goes to the bank. They say I actually that little bit that they needed were usually the for that. And, uh, but it's a lot of extra money for other than the pay payroll. The people went through this to come up with, uh, with supporting businesses. We were leaving our own businesses recently. And they did so good. Forgotten fruits, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's good. I haven't been there in a while. I know. That was all rummy stuff back in the day. Did you eat it? Yeah. But it brought a lot of people. The high breakfast and the harvest and them were held at Romney, but they were community associated with the food shelf and the They're all I added that there's a, I live in the there's an in crowd. And it's, and, 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 and,
mattress store that used to be the garden center? The mattress yes. store. Yeah, the mattress store. Yeah. 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 That, all of that is Berlin. It's actually Berlin. Uh, yeah. Wow, these towns are going to grow down a lot. Yeah. Well, and Berlin they spread out. out. Yeah, so yeah. then you can be in a portion of Berlin, but it's really close to an airport. Or you have to go to the airport. And you're right, there's like all these, like, you know. And like, what the hell is a little thing? But it's good. I literally go to Rugby. Yeah, I'm like, where did you end? Technically, it was like, I'm not going to tell you. 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 I'm not going to tell you.
said some uh, information that uh, to you as a new person that's trying to fit in, it can be super, super, super important and super like when sometimes people is talking in a conversation, you're like, what, what are you guys talking about? Like, you know, and you're always like being like, the, always making the same question. What is that? Like, what are you talking about? What is it? I mean, you don't know. And, then, and at some point you're like, oh, I'm not going to be this main the same question. So, <laughs> so I just found that that was very interesting. Like, um, it was just a part to say, um, um, as in their community, probably there's people that is not participating because they don't know how to participate. And, and that was uh, something I, I found very nice. I think we all did a good job of focusing to follow directions and focusing on our towns. But I was thinking about the other day driving through Montpelier behind a U32 bus and how many of our bus routes must travel through Montpelier. And just thinking about that sort of negative space, just negative. The, <laughs> yeah. Let me back up. <laughs> they don't have me recorded. But, but seriously, Montpelier is sort of a looming force around this district, and to deny its role in the community is would be disingenuous. Hi, uh, Dave Lawrence, Middlesex. Yeah, uh, two things that I noticed. Um, one was broadly in common. The other. Probably so, but it only came up in two towns. And the broadly in common was uh, Front Porch Warm is clearly an important resource to leverage. And I think maybe we could be making more use of it to not just post an announcement of an upcoming meeting, but use it as kind of like a mini newsletter of like, here's what's going on. Um, and I'll come back, put a pin on that one because I want to come back to that newsletter very briefly again. Uh, but the other thing I noticed was that. Uh, Worcester had it mentioned as the town royalty, but then it also came up uh, in Middlesex as the sense that maybe there's a little bit of cliquishness that goes on too. Um, uh, elitism was, I believe, the word that I used. It didn't end up on our board. It got, well, it did that. <laughs> but uh, I, I wonder to what, um, you know, uh, that might be impacting other towns as well. The sense that maybe there's like the in crowd in town and the people on the outside of that are having a little bit harder time getting engaged because they think that the same crowd is really the ones that are just running everything and it's hard to be involved. And I don't know how to um, cross that boundary, but I think it's something worth thinking about, of being aware of that social dynamic and how to get across that boundary. Um, and then the one thing I want to put a pin on on the newsletters is uh, most of the, the newsletters, at least for Romney, are, are distributed in uh, what's called the PDF format. And it's a terrible way to distribute information. Some people are not engaged because uh, it's difficult to read PDF, especially on mobile devices. And so uh, I've talked about it for years. I won't go too much in depth. But I really would like to see more of an attempt made to put uh, newsletter information into a more natural format that actually works better across the place. You're going to jump in as a crossover person as a Middlesex resident, and Worcester, we'll spend more time there. Um, so the, the interesting thing, we were over here chuckling about the, the Worcester royalty, because when we think of that, it's not, it's not an elitism thing, but it's the... Um, Heritage. It's, yeah, it's the heritage. It's the holders of all the information and the holders of the history of the town. Mm -hmm. um, They're the people who know stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, thinking about what what I was just having a little side conversation very briefly. But anyway, uh, with Natasha wondering, like, does Front Porch Forum? We do a lot of communicating through Front Porch Forum. Does it does it match? Or does it match? Does it reach everyone? And how do we reach it? And how do we leverage um, the well the dump in Worcester and LBJs to get? information out. Yeah, I think one thing that I've noticed too is that when I was looking at each one of these, there's the local businesses are listed, but there are other businesses that operate within this area. I mean, we actually, Berlin has the Chamber of Commerce, 
within its uh, bounds for Central Vermont. And there's some other organizations I know, that I, and I, I get to be a part of one of those, which also shows me like the bigger piece of, of business engagement, which I don't think we do. We list it places, but we don't engage them, right? They're just there for us right now. And so I think that sometimes, as you speak to it, Montpelier isn't really just the base of all of that, but it just seems to be where concentration of that activity goes on. And I think that that's an important place to engage um, more people, particularly some of our larger taxpayers, um, in terms of some of these businesses um, and what they do. The other thing that some have noticed, we listed U32 and people were like, hey, I thought in Berlin. And it wasn't that we were saying it was in Berlin, but it was the co-curricular events. So that those are those opportunities of getting not only um, direct families, but also grandparents or other people in the community that it's a way for all of us to access and to share what are ways to become involved, what are ways for us to get feedback and information. I, I, just a quick thought then, because I didn't see it show up anywhere, but as long as we're talking about the void that is Montpelier <laughs> and, um, and where we can have these other spaces where people come and gather, it occurs to me that in, I'm not sure exactly what level of engagement we're looking for out of businesses and so on, but if we're looking at how to spread information and, and reach people, it seems to me Keller Buggery would be actually a notable place for all the campuses, a place where people would be, you know, possible to see post-it signs and so on. So we keep talking about Montpelier because we sort of exist around it and I think there's an assumption that most of us flock to Montpelier for things we need but there are families on I'll say the outer northern edges where it is easier convenient closer for us to head to Waterbury and so there is a division within our district of the families who sort of congregate Waterbury side versus Montpelier, and there's probably crossover families who do both, but there is that, and sometimes it can feel less inclusive. I don't know. It, it's not always considered. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that. Barry and Queen Gilbert. That's all I was going to say. Barry and Queen Gilbert. But also, I was going to, you were talking about um, how to clickiness. And that definitely came up with us for Callus. We definitely had these clicks where there's these little centers, but there's, you know, all over the place, but there's no real one Callus center. We have Adamant, East Callus, Maple Corner, North Callus, you know, it's all over the place. And some of those can get very clicky and people not wanting to go over from one place to the other. So that's a big, it's a big challenge. Well, I just want to say thank you. I think this shows us how interconnected we are even within our other communities. And, and definitely our career center was also missing. I was saying, you know, and that's, you know, that's a huge part of why we're here too. So, yeah, right. So something that you can consider. Sure. It is um, with the consistent theme of reaching um, elderly or um, people who may not be comfortable with technology, that we have vibrant senior centers that serve our communities and perhaps having like a listening group opportunity on a you know quarterly basis in those settings might be another setting where we could be reaching people by going to them, to those community centers, since a lot of the places we talked about are places that you might spontaneously connect with somebody walking into Dudley's or going into your local pop, um, post office, etc. Thanks. Um, I was thinking about something you think we need to consider next. I was writing down some things that are just more questions maybe be helpful. Um, I think it goes to what Diane was saying about like what are some of the goals here. So some of the things I was asking myself in this conversation is like what, what are we expecting when we talk about community engagement? Is it info sharing? Is it people being physically present somewhere? Um, is it just the fact that there's strong avenues of communication? Um, is it people being involved in some way? Is it being and having a positive perception? Is it about, you know, the vote, like what, like what are we talking about? And I say that because 
I don't live in the district, I live somewhere else. And um, as I think about engagement in, in the community that I live in, I put on the other hat of not a school personnel person, but a community member. And I know as a responsible citizen that if I want some information, I have to make an effort to go seek it. I know where to find it. And I know that my town's school board or select board has those avenues of communication. Um, so it just kind of makes me think, are we, with these questions, are we thinking like people need to be coming to school board meetings versus other things like we have a we have communication avenues, but there's a responsibility of citizens to 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 seek and not just to be served at their doorstep. So I just think about those things about around community engagement. Yeah, and I think what we're hoping this is our first attempt at this, right? But what we're hoping is that it's all of that actually, right? And at different times we wanna just give information out like for budgeting, right? Like we're trying to pass the budget, we wanna give that information out, but make sure that before that we meaningfully reached out to the community so that we got their input and had a conversation. But so I think what at least the way that we were seeing this exercise is that it would inform all of those questions that, that you're saying. So for sometimes it's just gonna be we know that we can post in the side posts, for example, at East Montpelier, and that the Friends of Washington Central can spread the news about something, but that we might, from what we're here, need to provide food to be able to get people into coming to this community forum, right? And, and have a dialogue. But that we also need to reach out to maybe go to the senior centers or have a yeah, so and so. Is that is a way map, to us mapping is like getting a better understanding of who we're trying to reach, when we're trying to reach it, and how to reach it. And and this is just the first step. So we're gonna try to synthesize all this information into the sheets and uh, and then do it again, right? Like not do it again and make everybody maybe go somewhere to see who they're not reaching. But we don't, we don't have all the answers. We're, as we, it's an aspirational goal that we want to have a concrete <laughs> goal on as, as board members and as our expert in. And I think as a, we know that schools can do it alone, right? So we need the understanding of the community for any change that we want to do in our schools. With that. And yeah, and just to kind of close out this part, if there's something that you think of later that you wanted to add, um, this is in the packet, um, and we will also push it out through the newsletter. Um, it's already been out, I didn't check it to see what we have, but, um, and it just repeats these same questions. So I think we, we are, community members are safe for this, but we're turning to our board learning part of the, of the night. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, mate. Good work. This is great. Um, I don't know if we need to rearrange tables. Anybody needs to move anything, or you want me to stand? Or you want to do it no, I think you're right. Folks are uh, processing. That's important. I'm hearing a lot of processing going on in the room with a sense of, okay, what does this mean? And with this information, that's great. It has a texture. So uh, if you have an opportunity to glance through or read Just chapter three in like the book we've been looking I at together, skills. Improving School Board Effectiveness, a Balanced Governance Approach, the authors of chapter three are focusing in on a key element of school board work that is often overlooked, at, at, at minimum overlooked. And at best, it's given kind of a cursory view, or a lot of times school boards can have a bit of sort of misunderstanding that community engagement is like school to family partnerships or school to building partnerships. Uh, and so thinking about this one's gonna die. what kind of, when you think about it, the governance level strategically, What's the board's role? Uh, we're all community members, and so we come and we cross over, we wear multiple hats. Some school board members are 
teachers or administrators in other districts. Some have children that are in the system, so they have that parent hat. Uh, others are, are perhaps connected with a business or someone else that's connected with the school system. So there's a lot of sort of crossover of roles and engagement already. If we were to back out of that a couple of steps, what is that, again, legitimate place for the school board to be engaged with and to engage the community and involve the community in its work? And let me tell you some things that have emerged in research since this chapter was written. Build a strong connection or relationship between boards that believe they are engaging and involving the community in their work of setting a vision, setting goals, monitoring progress, reporting out. When boards report that they are doing those things, engaging the community in their work, they're more likely to be overseeing a system that is improving an achievement for all and closing gaps at the same time. That's why this is incredibly important. In fact, uh, research that's emerging this month and maybe next month before I have access to the full report suggests that boards may need to govern differently based on who their community is. So just incredibly important to know who your community is, and in our case, not just an individual town or school community, but the whole district. Like, what? how is Callis different than East Montpelier, or Middlesex different than Wooster? And what are the opportunities in one place that we might overlook in another? Uh, what are those natural connections to the community? So the authors, uh, when they wrote this chapter, they were drawing from social capital theory. A uh, pretty fancy word for how connected are people within the community or, or outside of the organization in which they serve. And what their, their theory is, or their premise is, that thriving organizations have a, a stronger connection between the board of directors and different community constituent groups and the board of directors has strong relationships among itself or within its own members. They use the terms uh, closure and brokerage. Brokerage has always disturbed me a little bit. There's a lot of connotations of brokerage that don't resonate with me, so I tend to use bonding and bridging. I wondered if there was a science teacher in the room. What are the scientific terms for bridging and bonding? Is it physics, chemistry? There's an overlap here. If the material holds together to itself, we call that cohesive. Thank you. And if it sticks to something else, we call that adhesive. Right. So that idea um, is the board sticking, right? Um, and is the board sticking together? Does it have adhesion and cohesion? The cohesion being really important. As you think about those couple of terms, I just draw your attention to, I want to say page 44, where they talk about uh, social capital theory. In the middle of the page, they write that these are critical elements. At the most basic level, school boards are influenced by two realities, internal relations among board members and external relations with other stakeholders in the community. These are critical elements when measuring social capital in organization. How well do board members work with each other? And what outside connections do they have? I've been in this work of school board development for going on 16 years, and uh, I was a school board member for several years before that. My phone is most likely to ring back in the days when people actually called people, uh, or I'm most likely to get an email from a board member or a superintendent that is concerned with which one of those two aspects, the board bonding with each other or the board bridging with the community. Which is more likely to prompt someone to reach out to me? The bonding, the bonding with each other, right? And we know, in fact, uh, Subsequent chapters here, the very next chapter talks a little bit more about drama in the boardroom and how that can cause chaos in the classroom. Uh, the first chapter deals with that. And there are school boards in other communities 
where members have a hard time getting along with each other. That's really critical. It, 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 you could say it's square one, but I'd hate to suggest that one of these areas is more important than the other because they're both really important. And uh, it's also important, and later in the chapter they unfold, it's not about groupthink. It's not like the board needs to think all the same way or have the same perspectives. In fact, quite the opposite. If everybody on the board agreed all the time, how many board members would you need? One, and floor could just govern the district, right? Um, I don't want to play into any thoughts people might have. Uh, as you think about that, though, the importance of having multiple people, multiple voices on the school board is multiple voices, multiple perspectives. In fact, if the board always agrees with each other, something's not right, something's wrong, and, and, and the decision is not likely to be the best. Uh, I, I could go a lot further in that because I spend a lot of time in that area. How do we help boards see this is not about groupthink when we say we need to be united, we need to be united as a team. It's not that we're losing our individual voice or our identity. In fact, we're probably strengthening that. There was uh, research done about 10 to 15 years ago, pretty popular, Stephen Covey's son, Stephen M. R. Covey, uh, published a few books out of that research, and the first one I think was called Speed of Trust. So that when there's high trust in an organization, things get done quicker. And as they point out in this chapter, one of the pieces that's super important to that, when there's high trust, people collaborate and they share information, right? When there's trust. Now that could be true internally for the board members with each other, and that could also be true with the community and the board or the school system. Again, when there's high trust, people share information, they collaborate, and things get done more quickly. When there's low trust, it's constant drama. Everything's slower. I'm wondering what her motivations were for why she asked that question. I'm wondering why he made that motion, you know, what does he really want, right? We become more suspicious, and that takes a lot of energy, a lot of mental bandwidth, and it just bogs things down. So one of the important pieces for school boards to consistently be mindful of, and I would say this you know, extends to school administration and the school community as a whole, how are we doing on trust? Are we, are we having trust for each other? If someone says something, are we trusting that that comes from a good place, they really mean it? Or, and I've had this happen before too, where I was doing a workshop like this, and a board member turned and faced the camera, and the legislature needs to do blah, blah and they had a C-SPAN moment. <laughs> and at, at the time, I wondered, I mean, we're talking about superintendent evaluation, all of a sudden, and, the, and it's like, oh my word, and you know, cameras don't help, right? I, I mean, and anytime you get a situation where somebody is saying to someone the next day or at the coffee shop, did you see how I told them last night? That's not a good sign, right? So uh, trust has to come from an authentic place where we are true to ourselves and, and sharing our truth. Like it, it requires some vulnerability. I was talking with a couple people before we got started here this evening and we were talking about how important that is, but if we don't feel safe, we're not likely to be vulnerable. If we don't feel safe, if we feel like our position may be threatened, our reputation may be threatened, our uh, role on the board or our role in the community or our position in the district, if we can't speak our truth, we need to be mindful of that. There, there are some great self-assessment questions that are embedded in this chapter. I, I really appreciated those. I think they would lend themselves well to a board just doing kind of a two different checklists, right? How are we doing uh, in our bonding with each other? Are we able to say what needs to be said? Are we able to hear uh, clearly what someone's saying to us? Or are we always looking for hidden motives? And then the other checklist of self-assessment about our connections with the community. We just did an exercise, which I know this is like one piece of the ongoing work of thinking about who is our community, 
how are we engaged, who's connected to whom, and those lists began to be formed as, as the author talked about here in this chapter, of how important that is to identify who are we connected with, and then perhaps who are we not connected with. Now if the board finds that a lot of people are connected with the same people, then do board members need to break those connections, or what? Anybody get to that nugget in the chapter? What do you do if a bunch of board members are connected to the same group, but you're, you're missing other connections in the community? Add Personally? Connections. Add connections, right? And diversify who is connecting in that missing chunk, right? Like, right, yeah. They, they talk about add connections and then diversify who's missing in the chunk. Who are we not connected with? I've seen that be a powerful exercise for school boards to recognize there, there's a community. And maybe it's people who are hearing impaired. It can be any type of grouping in the community, but no one is connected to that group. What are we going to do? Who's got a connection, a relationship, an opportunity? What, what are some of the benefits or results of a lot of connections in the community? How does that benefit the school board or benefit the district? Yeah, well, Chris. The flow of information that you might not otherwise have. Absolutely, that flow of information. They, they talked about that. Uh, they, you might get a heads up on a road's not going to be plowed, or you may just get a heads up on a political thing, anything, right? Just flow of information. And then um, two-way flow, right? So that uh, that segment of the community is hearing about the needs or concerns of the school district as well as the school district, school board, having a conduit uh, of information coming to them. Good, so we, we had a, a few questions that I shared with you in advance. Let me um, pull those up and see how far off track I might be. Um, the author suggests, we, we got into the two realities a little bit, how might individual school board members enhance trust among the board, district, and community without making promises that are outside of the role of one board member alone. How can individual school board members enhance trust among the board and within the community without making unilateral promises that they don't have the ability to fulfill? What are some promises they could make, personally? I think having, as a board, having norms that you've discussed, uh -huh. and then you as a board member be consistent to those so that people you represent understand that you will always be consistent to those. Yep, and, and a lot of times we call that um, operating protocols, but having norms as a board that everybody agrees to and does their best to adhere to can go a long ways toward building trust because things become predictable. Lead by example, show the actions you do. Lead by example, yeah. I, I've said this many times in the last three months in Vermont, that boards need to model the type of behavior that they would expect to be happening in the classroom. And it's interesting as an older adult myself, how quickly we can lose that concept, right? That we. We wouldn't allow or expect that kindergartners would behave in a certain way, but yet, as adults, you've probably seen this before, um, sometimes, you know, we behave outside of the norms of what we would expect school children. Yeah, seriously? No yeah. Whoa. I'm, sure, <laughs> crazy. I'm sure not your parents or anyone who lives no on your street. Yeah. <laughs> what else is there, what else could a board member do individually? Yes, sir. I think one promise we can make is to just listen to people <laughs> and, re it. and reflect upon it. Yes. One promise we can make is to listen. Thank you. And, and I appreciate it you added to reflect on it. Yeah. You can also just inform the board that I'm going to go and meet with this community member or community group and then report back. So, so it's not a surprise to anybody. So that concept has a norm of no surprises and also kind of individual transparency, um, telling folks in advance, I'm, I'm gonna go meet with this disturbed, upset patron, uh, whatever it is, right? Who, whatever it is, and, yeah. and then share back. This is what I found. 
Laura? Be committed to the goals of the district, right? Like one thing that we can do is we're talking to our community members. It's like we have this shared goal. So yeah. to make sure that, you know, we're sharing those and be committed to that. Doesn't mean that your opinion doesn't matter, but you're committed to that and believe that all students can learn, right? That's something that we can always share. Really important. As individual board members, we're always going to have our own interests. We're going to have things that are important to us, and we're going to have things we feel strongly about. But making sure that whenever we're having conversations with others, we're also putting forward those agreements that we as a board have made to uh, commitment goals, uh, purpose, and particularly to children. And as you think about this, um, so I, I feel like we got a lot out of that. You know, the what else and the listening really important and, and really authentically then what you added, reflecting on what we heard, um, what is somebody trying to tell us. To, to what extent, let's, let's just think a little hypothetical so it doesn't get rough. Um, to what extent is a typical school board representative of all segments of the community they represent? And why might that be an important area for a board to explore? Kari, some other board that you've heard of, maybe in Massachusetts. Um, to what extent does a school board tend to represent all segments of the community? It's hard to, hard to assess. Um, it I, my sense is not that well. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, uh, we know the people we know and, and what we know. And it's a lot of work to reach out. It, it takes a lot of uh, intention to follow through, to, to connect, to even to identify uh -huh. the, di the different constituencies. And yeah, we don't know what we don't know. Uh, the last credible national survey of school board members, uh, 2009, really suggested at that time that school board members were likely to be more traditionally inclined than the general public. Um, they were likely to be more affluent, more likely to be white, more likely to be male, uh, more likely to be older. Um, you know, the kind of a typology of that tendency that historically um, other groups have not been re as represented on school boards. And maybe not a current issue in Vermont. I, I don't know these numbers. I'll need to find out now. Uh, but in some states, still, there's a real lack of representation of women on school boards, uh, which is interesting and you know, may, maybe not a surprise, depending on the uh, ethos of those states. But I am curious now that I put it out there in Vermont, what are the, what are the numbers? How does that look? Um, are we, yeah, Tasha? I was just going to say, I think that there's a certain amount of privilege Mm -hmm. that comes with being on the board you know whether it's the privilege of you're in a you're in a two-income household and so there's another person who can watch the children while you're at a meeting or you know you are retired so you have the time to sit on the board or you know yeah. so there's there's certain there's certain things that allow a group of people to be able to be on a school board that are not going to allow a number of our constituents to be able to sit on the school board and, and so then we're not hearing their voices. So uh, that point, uh, that, I, it, I would say that that's not limited to school boards. No, right. no, right. absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely not. And this is peculiar, <laughs> empty space. So, you know, a lot has been talked about this with, when it comes to school boards and written about it. And interestingly, just to be fair, right? Um, school boards are the most representative of any other group of people in any kind of governance in our country, but when you compare that to the U.S. Senate, you know, it doesn't say a whole lot. <laughs> so, and, or the Nobel, right? Um, yeah, why is representation important? Well, good points, Natasha made. Uh, it, it takes a certain amount of social capital. You have to have enough financial stability that you can either take off work or be off work or have childcare or have gas to get there. I mean, it, there are a lot of folks 
in our community that couldn't serve on the school board because they don't have the time or the, the resources. Yeah. I think there's also the like baseline skills that make it um, comfortable to approach uh -huh. taking a board a commitment, pursuing a board commitment, um, whether it's appointed or elected. Yeah. And <clears throat> this kind of goes back to our town-based conversations and when our kids learning about civics and then how are those conversations wow. extending if there is a dinner table conversation at home you know because <clears throat> we're trying to reach the next generation yeah. of people who might explore this as something they want to have as part of their adult lives but also bringing those conversations to adults who may not have considered it yeah. right because if you're not if it has it's not part of your family culture or something that you through volunteerism in your high school career or in some other capacity if you haven't been part of a group think yep. exper experience like this or Robert's Rules of Order. There's a uh, lot of the things that are intimidating about participating in a board beyond the like socioeconomic and you know time commitments. That, that education piece is is huge. We don't have time to go into all the things wrong with Robert's <laughs> Rules of Order, but I mean, it, it is the epitome of European centric thinking. It, it, it really is the epitome of that. And, and what you're saying about, you know, as Natasha said, it takes some finances, it takes some resources, it may take some other kinds of skills. I have worked with school board members that were functionally illiterate. And, you know, there, there are people with less than an eighth grade education serving on school boards across the country, uh, but it tends to be rare. And, uh, you know, there are people from every kind of background, but. It, it, it's interesting. It's not lost at the state level right now that we have a very um, strong tradition, commitment to local control, but we're not preparing students and young people to exercise local control well. Like it's, it's we're not raising generations to be able to know how to be part of the group and how to adhere to group norms and how to maybe confront group problems, right, in a, in a healthy, respectful way. It's something I, I think it behooves us to think a bit more about. How do we prepare people to serve in a democratic um, setting, like a school? This is Rich, I, I hate to talk too much. Yeah, Steve. I, I think one thing, too, about that I've noticed about our boards over the years is it's generally people who have had kids or have kids in the school system. And so when we talk about those groups that are not represented, the, the, uh, if you didn't have a child right. in, in this school system, the likelihood of you being engaged in it through yes. particularly board membership is probably extremely low. I, I'm trying to think, I don't know of any board member who hasn't at least had a kid in the district. Uh, and it's funny what you're saying. I've heard board members say, you know, you have no business to be on the school board if you don't have kids in the school. And I've heard retired board members say, you don't have any business being on the school board if you have kids in the school, you're too busy, you've got conflicts of interest. You know, I've heard both sides of that. But it, yeah, it, it would be something to give some thought to. Uh, how is the board getting representation, hearing from? Well, that there's models of boards now that we start to see where they say, here's a person from this segment yes. of the community yeah. needs to be a part of the board, or a person yeah. from this segment of the community needs to be a part of the board, which is a very different way than, you know, electing, um, an, you know, your neighbor to, be, right. to right. be that person. And that's, I mean, it can create a very different and diverse board if, you, if you're looking for that. I have a lot of creative names coming to mind. I've been part of those conversations before, so it's like Mount Molly and, you know. Um. I, I just want to say that part of the reason that, I think as a, as a foreigner, right, a part of the reason that is, is that we tend in Vermont to just look at Vermont, right? So when we look at the donut, it's not just the donut, it's just, it's New Hampshire, it's Massachusetts, it's the entire United States and then the world, because if we knew what the lack of public education was, you would have people running to be board members, right? If we knew what is going on in Tennessee or what is going on in Kentucky or what's going on in Texas, right? So so is that this connect too that the don't you know, we go beyond here and that's good for our students to understand too. Which I think we do a good job in IU thirty two, but we are 
Or should be as yeah. concerned about what Montpelier is doing. You know, we'd be as concerned as all of our students. That's a good point. What can we learn from New Hampshire? What can yeah. we learn from neighboring states or other places? Uh, and and model a little bit of an anti-ethnocentric behavior. It's, well, it's good for most people. So we we talk about modeling. I want to ask the, the board members. How many, raise your hand if you had a parent or a close family member mm. who was on a school board or a select board or some kind of local public service ah, when you were a kid? School board members, did you have someone in your family so That's not as many as I would have thought. <laughs> but it's still, it's still a sizable time. It's a factor. Yeah. And, and I've worked with boards in Vermont that have had a family on board for more than 80 years, or I, I think even more than that, a family member, right? Yeah, uh, it is kind of, it can be a legacy thing, which is not horrible, right? You're, you're raising your children to serve. Um, a little bit mindful of time, not a lot. Oh, no. Sorry. Can I ask a question that goes off of that? Please. How many of you would want someone that you have, like are an ally with on the school board in your school when you were a kid? Does that make sense? Wait. Almost. How many, okay. <laughs> you're close, it's, it's close. So, you asked how, like, if you had a family member in it and only two of you raised your hand. I think it was four. four. Yeah, four. Oh, sorry, I can't see. <laughs> how many of you wished there were more people like yourselves that were involved with your uh, school when you were our age? Raise your hands. Yeah. Yeah. A few. Yeah. I didn't know who I was then. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about my school school to be fair. So. Yes, I, I was an unusually involved child in high school, uh -huh. and that still is a pretty foreign concept to me. I just would not have really expected. I went to school board meetings as a kid, right? And it just never would have occurred to me. Wow, that's really strange. Right, that, it, to, to, to expect that like my mom should have been there or something like that, right? Like, I knew since I was eight years old I wanted to be on a school board. I didn't know what they did, but I thought it was important and I wanted to be on. <laughs> so we, so we, we, we've talked a lot about the barriers to entry, and some of those barriers are systemic, and some of them are choices that we make, like what, what Maggie, you, you said, like there's, how do we, like, I think that's a really, really important barrier to entry, like the, the time commitment, right, and the volunteerism, right, with the little token stipend, but feeling comfortable enough and, uh, to, to even approach the idea of that you know I that's really hard I, I hope that all of us on the board have at some point talked to other people in our community about joining the school board <laughs> and that those people are I don't know what you're talking are about, always you know of the same social you know socioeconomic <laughs> strata yeah. that this board is populated with and we've talked a number of times about how do we increase that socioeconomic you know, diversity on the board because there, that representation is, is not there. Mm -hmm. um, Maggie had me thinking about another kind of foundational belief system of volunteering with the stipend to be on the board is that your voice deserves to be heard. And so it's interesting to think of from the age of eight, you knew like, oh, that's something that I want to do. I heard of it. And there's a whole subset of our population that have been told repeatedly that they don't have a voice or it doesn't deserve to be heard. And that's something that I think makes it even more challenging to access. Right? Like that's a that's a certain amount of autonomy you have over yourself to believe that that's a space you that deserve to makes, be in. That also makes your job as an educator so much more important. Right, because the more the people have their voices heard, don't put it back on me, Jonah. Of course I am. That's the whole point. No, no, no. I hear you. I'm just yeah. saying that there, like, that's a big belief system to think yeah. I should be heard in my community. Yeah. And there's a lot. Is right. It starts. Yeah. When, when they're kidding. little, let them know that they have a voice and they. And that can be has to be heard. Right. Parents system. too. Mm -hmm. Parents. Yes. Yeah. It's too absolutely key to that as well. That the teachers. Yeah. Joint well, part of this entire conversation is because knowing that our board is not currently physically populated with voices from all the corners, we have to figure out then how do we get them. Because some of those barriers, we're not going to be able to resolve, the, right? The barriers of what allows our board members to be here and participate, 
we can't fix those all, or at least we can't fix them right away. And so it's incumbent on us to figure out how do we get the voices, even if they are not, even if the goal is not to get them on the board, although I think yeah. that is a good goal. And while we're working on that, how do we at least make sure they're perspective and shared? I'm, I'm going to shut up for a while. His hands are all over. Um, I just also, I want to go back briefly to if you've never seen an agenda, if you've never mm -hmm. encountered what is a moderator, there's like, well, there's so much that, um, it, it's not exclusive to school boards, it's board participation in general and volunteerism, and, um, and I do think we do a good job in this evidence in part by these young ladies here with us today and the, the, um, groups that we have after school at both the elementary and the middle and high school level here. But I think that just understanding the, how these systems work is a, a, just another layer, regardless of your economic or social status um, or whether you have kids at home. I was just going to say, Megan sort of went where I was going or hoping to go, which is like action steps. And it, it just occurred to me that it's one thing to sit on a board and enjoy your privilege and be on that board. It's another thing to like publicly call out your own privilege and to to you know identify yourself to the community as a tool and leverage that privilege to bring other voices into the conversation. I was going to say I think about a lot about um, that a lot has to do with the quality of the board meeting experience. Uh, I know lots of people who have the privilege and the smarts and the time to serve on the board, but when you ask them, oh, no, thank you for doing this. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you're a sink. And, and, I, and I think it's not easy, but we have to really attend to having high energy, effective meetings mm -hmm. in, in, for anybody to be interested in, in yeah. doing it. Uh, because it, it can be deadly boring. It appears that it's a brand new issue. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of, of that. I mean, there are communities where I wouldn't want to be on that board. Uh, I was just thinking that I've been in a lot of different states, and most recently Maryland, where they they are appoint school board members. The governor appoints school board members, so it's all about who you know. And it's usually the worst people that could possibly. I mean, so you try like so we would get the right governor elected to get the right people on the school board, um, and and when coming back to Vermont, thinking we are such a lucky state that we do have local autonomy the way that we do, and like I recognize that as a kid because my dad was the justice of the peace, and even when he didn't run, they still elected him justice of the peace, um, and and he really took that job very seriously. Like he was like, the, the community has put a trust in me to do a certain job and that instilled in me this idea of like, your word is your bond. And you know, like you, you really want to live up to what people think of you. Um, and I think that that's something that is really special about this state. And I think that it's something that we need to continue to work, not just in our homes, but also in our school systems to like perpetuate that idea of we have this wonderful system where people can really be as involved as they want to be because there's so many different ways to do it. So how do we, to Maggie's point, get people comfortable to have those skills to be able to participate in all of these different ways? So as they get older, they want to stay in Vermont. <laughs> they want to raise their kids in the communities that they were raised in, and they want to participate in their communities and be active members of it. Love it. Yeah, you know, for as much as we miss with school board representation in communities, uh, in those systems where school board members are appointed, and that's been around since the late 1800s, uh, some cities like Chicago, they've gone back and forth over and over, appointed and then not appointed, and the pendulum swings, somebody so is often trying to get to representation. But what they find is that people that are appointed are way less likely to uh, be a minority. They're way less mm -hmm. likely to uh, be lower socioeconomic status. I mean, it, whatever you want to point out as far as representation yeah. problems with locally elected boards, it's, it's worse when they're appointed. One of the things that I thought of when you said pendulum, so the balance between structure and making 
really engaging, accessible board meetings, there is a bit of a pendulum because sometimes the structures that we use, and I don't mean Robert's rules, but the concepts that we use to organize ourselves are also what protect us from, quite frankly, um, perspectives that could find their way onto the board and not feel like what we think. So when we think about setting our vision, setting what we, you know, setting our, this earlier we were talking about how do we monitor the system, but making that preserved. So there is a balance between uh, not tearing down all the structures because the structures protect us from, from um, staying true to our vision and yet making Great point. Uh, making more space for more people, more ideas, more different perspectives, and which kind of moves board chair, vice chair, like what about board meetings if we want to get to practical steps? You know, what about board meetings are either engaging of the community or a barrier to the community? Um, word choice, items on the agenda, um, what items are first? <laughs> You know, what are those things that people tune out before they actually fully tune in? And, and how might we get there? Um, so I'm looking at the time realizing we've just got a few more minutes. I want to make sure we kind of encapsulate a couple of thoughts. One is that we know representation is important. And who's on the board is important. Uh, but as has been brought out, also how do we hear from people in segments that may not be on the board for a variety of reasons of their own choosing. That's not something they're going to do. How do we make sure we're hearing from them? And, and for me, what's been a, a nagging concern over the last three or four years is it's not just about sort of who's on the board and who we hear from, but what do we do with that information? How, how does governance advance a more inclusive, more supportive, um, a better future than, than what we've inherited. Um, you know, how does governance help promote inclusivity? Because inclusivity? Uh, I think that's a really, really big one. We know students need to have that sense of place, sense of belonging, I feel safe here, um, but I, our community does too. And how might a board, um, whether it is something to do with the agenda, the way the meetings are run, or other opportunities to provide access in, in engagement. Uh, how does a board actually govern in ways that makes a difference for students and families from those various populations? We don't know enough about that. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting because I've read lots of articles in the last 20 years of criticizing boards for not being representative enough, not having more diversity on the board and so forth. But just because someone looks like they might represent a group or sounds like they might represent a group doesn't mean that decisions are being made at the dais that actually advance opportunities for that group. And so that kind of that next step, I, I would encourage you to be thinking about as you think about who is our community, who are our students, how do we serve them, how will that affect the way you mobilize your policies, what, what word choices, what ideas might be in there, how does it affect budgeting, how does it affect the conversation that the board is having with itself, among itself, um, to model something that's inclusive. Again, I, I said it, I really wasn't joking. Um, there are lots of boards and lots of communities in the US I wouldn't want to be a part of, and many of you would not want to either. So how does the board ensure that, that its persona um, behind the scenes and in the public is one that people would want to step into, right? How, how does the board behave at a dais in a way that's respectful, um, but yet is also all voices clearly being heard when there's differences of opinion? How, it's age old, but how do we disagree agreeably? <laughs> How do, we, how do we model civility that seems to be missing? I mean, if you just really want to be entertained tonight, you can't sleep sometime, just do a Google search, school board's gone wild. And, and the type of outlandish behavior is almost hard to fathom. Um, chairs being thrown. Um, I, some of the boards in the top 10 I've probably worked with 
and it's it's interesting because there's there's just challenges that we have to think. Okay, now what are what about us, right? Not what about them, but what about us? How do we how do we model? How do we include? How do we invite people in? Um, invite them into the conversation and invite them in to be with us, full participants. So lots of rich stuff in this chapter. Again, the self-assessment is something the board might consider. Um, here, here's an easy way to self-assess. Are we reaching out and bridging with the community? And are we bonding as a team that's able to do good work together? I know my time's right at up. Any last word to take away from the book or something that you have had in a hall in the last 45 minutes? Chris? Do they get to the why um, when you talk about boards getting together, working well, and bridging the community? Why that has an impact on student achievement? Mm -hmm. It says it does, but it doesn't yeah, yeah, explain yeah. the mechanism of why. I, I think we're learning more about that all the time. You know, uh, about the, what is the potential connections, but be careful because in like governance research, no credible person is ever going to call it causation. The school board did this, and that caused students to have thriving, amazing lives, right? It, it's, it's too far removed. What we do know is that in systems where students are graduating and having thriving, amazing lives, that boards tend to behave differently than boards in systems where students are struggling and, and graduating not prepared for what's next. Like, we know boards behave differently in those two different extremes. Uh, but but why, where's a uh, potential causal link? Uh, I don't know a credible researcher that can make a plan, like any plan. It, it's, it, and it's, it, it gets really fuzzy here, but I was saying to a couple people before we started, like when I, uh, we use board self-assessment data to say, okay, the board says it's doing these things, how are the students doing on some metric, right? There, there's something really powerful when the board says they're engaging and involving the community in their work. Again, they're way more likely to be overseeing a system that's improving and achievement overall and closing gaps. But I couldn't begin to tell you that the board was actually engaging the community because when you, you do that research well, there's questions in there that the board absolutely doesn't do, but they say they do it. So I. You know, is it a culture? Is it a culture of inclusivity? Is it a, is it an attitude? Is it a, I, I'm trying to not use the word spirit. <laughs> you know, is it an atmosphere in the board, in the community, in the district that people are embracing and including? And does, does that have power in itself? Um, just the fact that we say we're including the community, what does that mean? Thanks for your time tonight, Floor. Uh, I know you've got a meeting to follow to reset floor. And, yes. So. Thank you, Neil, yeah. for tonight. It was really helpful. Great. Have an amazing <laughs> meeting. Yeah. And, and the young lady's got books tonight. Yeah. You got this. Wow. We just did like a mission. And we're neighbors. <laughs> And he lives in Middlesex, yeah. too, by the way. I still know that he's in Middlesex. Where do you live? I live in Government Hill. You live on Government Hill. Uh, North Bears Hall. So okay. Oh, you're yeah. 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 south. Yeah. We're all connected. Should I have a motion to go into the next session? Yeah, so I moved to the board. And I just took the gift of North Bears Hall. And I was like, oh my god, what is wrong with this road? It's the first time. Well, it does. But it's even a worse situation now. The last time I did it was two years ago.